This morning we're blessed to have Pastor Adam bring our message. Uh, Father Darrell and his family are on vacation. We would encourage you to pray for them that it would truly be a time of rest, peace, and refreshment for them. That's uh, one of those rare times that he's gone. So please keep them in prayer, but also encourage you to pray for Adam. He has a good message for us this morning. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. God Amen. Bless you, sir. It is always a, a blessing to be able to speak to you all. Um, it's something that doesn't get to happen very often because as Father Mitch made reference to, we have a very faithful rector who makes sure to order his schedule to be with his people. Because, oh, children, you are dismissed. I should know of all, I should know of all people. I, I literally, I do have a note of this later on in my uh, introduction, so, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. Um, but we have a faithful a faithful shepherd who truly cares about us and does not want us to be without him. And so I take this as a privilege because in that same regard, he does not just let anyone, which many times leaves me wondering, sir, are you sure you want me to speak for you? Um, but it's a great privilege. But this morning, we are going to be dwelling mainly on the gospel reading, the feeding of the 5,000. For most of you Bible scholars out there, you know that this story takes place in every gospel account. Other than the, death of it, the account of his death and resurrection, it is the only miracle to quote-unquote make the cut, so to speak, for every gospel writer. The interesting aspect of this is that every writer brings his own detail into the story because everyone speaks of it tells the story very similarly with small details that are different between them. But this morning, we will focus on the account of St. Mark out of the sixth chapter. To better understand this story, let's expand beyond the immediate reading of what we heard this morning and begin to look at the context in which the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. You see, the, the, the gathering of the 5,000 is not a random event. Well, try to gather 5,000 people time now, and you will see that that is no easy feat, especially in those days. It came with a little bit extra difficulty. There was no mass communication. There was no way to just send out a tweet or a mass text for everybody to come and gather. But 5,000 men is what they gather. You see, before, at the very beginning of the reading, Mark 6.30 says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. Your question when you hear phrases like that was, well, where were they? What have they done? What, what are they talking about? You see, if we look earlier in Mark chapter 6, the 7th verse, we see the sending of the 12 in pairs. They were giving special and unique instructions for this mission. And they, it is indeed very unique, their mission that they were sent out on. They were instructed to take nothing except for a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts. You are allowed to wear sandals, but do not put on two tunics. Stay at a single house in each town, and if they don't receive you, leave. And when you leave those places that reject you, don't even take the dust with you. Shake it off your sandals. This authority and tasking given by Jesus resulted in people repenting, the casting out of demons, and miraculous healings. The authority of Jesus was no longer kept with just him, but was given to his disciples. And the ministry was so busy and action-packed that eating even the act of taking a break to eat had become a luxury for the twelve. However, the side effect of this trailblazing ministry had resulted in twelve, but very, very exhausted men. Jesus, seeing this, commanded them to rest in a desolate place. I can only imagine the exhaustion that they were experiencing. And as I was reading this, I began to think of times where I was absolutely exhausted. And one of the ones that comes to mind 
is a camping trip gone awry in the Ozarks, which sounds like the beginning of a terrible novel. You see, myself and three of my buddies, my sophomore year of college had decided that we wanted a challenging camping trip to test out all the latest gear that we had been collecting and refining. And so we decided to do a 30 mile loop and to have a nice leisure hike over two days. The first day went according to plan. The second day, however, is when it all went awry. We woke up that morning later than we had hoped. We had turned off our cell phones because, well, battery life wasn't what it is today. <laughs> and it really wouldn't have done us much good because if you looked at it at the top of all of our cell phones with the simple phrase, no service. So we turned them off, and, but consequently that was also our alarm clocks and us not being the smartest um, individuals, the sharpest tools in the shed, so to speak. Uh, we woke up late because we were tired from the day of hiking before. And we had thought to ourselves, oh, well, this is no big deal. We'll make it through tomorrow and finish this out. Boy, were we wrong. You see, that morning we woke up, and three of us were feeling great, ready to face the day. We're a little sore. We had slept on the ground, but, you know, it is what it is. We're men. That is what men do. We're supposed to go out, hike in the woods, sleep on the ground. Ugh, man stuff. One of our friends, however, had a knee that had swollen to twice its size. And even going for him to go to wash his face in a nearby creek and to use the bathroom was a painful experience. Unfortunately, we were at exactly the halfway point, which if you know anything about halfway points, it is whether you go back to the beginning, it is the same. As if you go to the very end and finish it, well, it is the same. That is how math works, cutting things in half. So we pushed on. We said, well, if we're going to do this, let's at least finish the hike. We can say that we did the entire loop, and that might have not been the wisest thing, because if we had looked closer at our map, we would realize that the hardest and greater elevation gains were happening in the second half of the loop. And so we hiked, and we hiked, and we hiked, breaking off. And at some points, we were literally underneath of our friends carrying him up the hill. We had already taken his gear and given it to each other, and so we were already heavier on top of having to carry our 200-pound friend out of the woods. But pride kept us going. And I remember it had gotten dark, and he said, I can't do it anymore. And at that point, we were looking fully on the moon. It was high in the sky, and it was night. You see, a small detail of the story of no service was uh, I had promised my then fiance, now wife, that we would be back for Easter Sunday. And I knew that if we didn't get back, then we would have a search team looking for us. And so our injured friend was like, no, let's just stay here. This is a wonderful place to sleep. It's flat ground. And I said, no, that is not an option. Because even at that moment, I had enough common sense not to mess with my wife. Now wife, I, I was smarter than that. <laughs> And so we pushed on, and we pushed, and we pushed, and we pushed, and it was about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning by the time we got to my car. And so we pack up quickly and began to drive back the four hours that we had to make it back for Easter Sunday. Well, we thought we had made all the right decisions regarding logistics for fuel. Because I thought to myself, I, once again, we, we've established the idea that a halfway point means that's a halfway point. But if you know anything about vehicles, that 50% on your fuel tank doesn't mean that you truly only, you've gone through half of your tank. Most tanks measure actually very low. At that point, really, you should be looking for fuel. And we knew that, and so we were. But if you know anything about the middle of nowhere in Arkansas, it is truly in the middle of nowhere Arkansas. <laughs> we could not find a gas station that was open. And so we, our mission to get home soon turned into the mission to get fuel. We needed gas or else we were going to be walking the rest of that journey. And so we finally saw the lights after driving and, and looking at our maps and nearby gas stations because at that point we didn't have smartphones. And we saw the, the glimmer of hope down the road, which was the sign 
of a gas station. You see, that same glimmer of hope, well, that we thought was hope, had led us astray many a times because they were closed. But this one we knew would be different. And it surely was. However, in the light of that sign, my car came to a stop. And so we were left with a decision. And fortunately, we weren't far. We were about uh, between a half a mile and a quarter mile from the gas station. And so we said, we'll go get some, we'll get, we'll go get some fuel. We'll figure it out. We had no gas can. We had no container. And at that point, if we had to fill up our Nalgene bottles to bring the fuel back to my car, we were willing to do whatever it took to get back. And we were exhausted at this point. We were tired. We were beyond tired. We had been hiking and hauling a friend, but we managed to make that half mile. When we got there, the only thing we could find were gallons of waters, but we knew that a gallon was a gallon no matter what. So we took the gallon of water. We dumped it out in the bush. We didn't want to be wasteful. At least let the bush enjoy the water of that gallon. They didn't have any gas cans at all, which I thought was odd for a gas station. I, 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 you should have these. This would make sense. But we filled up that gallon for water, and I I was remembering some of my science classes. I knew that gasoline was able to melt through quite a few materials, and I was really hoping this was not one of them. It held, fret not. And that gallon of gas was enough to drive or go walk back. I don't know how we got it, because we didn't even have a funnel, and we just kind of waterfalled it into the, the, the gas tank, so to speak, so we could make the rest of that journey. At this point... It was early in the morning, and we still had a few hours to go. And so we drove and we drove, and I looked back, and my three friends were so bold about this trip, were now sleeping in my car as I blared music and drank water to stay awake. And we finally made it back in time for me to take a shower and load right back in the vehicle to go to Easter Sunday service. It was an adventure. I was tired. I remember going to bed that day, and I slept, I think, better than I've ever slept in my life. I was exhausted. I had nothing left in the tank, well, like my car at some point of that trip. We were truly in a desolate place, and we had gone there to find rest, and that is not what we found. The disciple situation was very similar. If you notice in the reading, Mark mentions the word desolate or the desolate nature of this area three times, almost to emphasize that they were indeed in the middle of nowhere, and they were trying to get some rest. They had gone through great work to get there. However, the people had something else in mind. They recognized the men who had been going town to town, casting out demons and healing the sick on the boat, almost to say, hey, that's Peter. He he healed my aunt. That's, that's, that's Judas. He, he cast a demon out of that boy in the middle of town. Let's go see where they're going. I know where they're going. Let's chase them down. But Mark, being the book of action, says that the people got there ahead of him. There was no rest to be had. The retreat was shortly lived, and they were thrust back into the very mission they were trying to escape. And that is the state in which the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. You see, the sermon title for today is Jesus Meets Us, dot, dot, dot. Jesus, for my first point, Jesus meets us in our weakness, in our tiredness, in our I am giving up, I can't do this any longer-ness. That is where He meets us, and many times I've found that that is actually where he shows us that he is God, and we are not. When Jesus steps off of the boat, the condition of the 5,000 is sad, it is grievous, it is absolutely terrible because Jesus sees them. They are so desperate for leadership and spiritual guidance, they literally drop everything to follow Jesus, forgetting to pack even food. They are lost and have chased the boat carrying Jesus, and they have arrived in the middle of nowhere. Jesus looks at them with compassion in their desperate state, and the text says that they were like sheep without a shepherd. This is not an unfamiliar phrase 
throughout Scripture. So let me refresh your memory a little bit. We see this phrase, sheep without a shepherd, multiple times throughout Scripture. In Numbers 27, Moses, frightened of what will happen to the Israelites, pleads for a successor who will go into the presence of the Lord and bring that to the people, lest they be like sheep without a shepherd. In 1 Kings 22, after the death of King Ahab, in battle, the men are scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And Ezekiel 34 gives a warning to the, men, to the shepherds of Israel using this phrase, using this analogy. And this is what he says. He says, you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they are scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. This is the state of the 5,000. They are like sheep without a shepherd. Their spiritual and religious leaders had failed them in almost every way that you could fail a group of people looking to line their own pockets, lift their own name, all in the name of religion. Their leader, Herod, if you look at the story immediately before this, had got just finished beheading John the Baptist, not because he had truly done something wrong, but as a party favor because, oh, your guests, they must be pleased. And so John the Baptist's head is taken from him. The people are like a sheep without a shepherd. The situation is sad and dire. The situation needs a miracle. And that is exactly what they get. It was in this environment the Lord gives us a glimpse of the Eucharistic feast in which we come to him desperate, tired, and unworthy, and he gives us himself. This seems to be the place that the Lord calls people into, more dependent on him, more reliant on him. I remember a church not too long ago with a note for $1.9 million praying for provision because they could not do it on their own. But the Lord provides. In our weakness, He was made great. We cannot stray from that as a people that must become a core tenet of who we are as Church of the Ascension, knowing that when we come to Him in our lowly state, that He will exalt us, not we ourselves. We cannot stray from that mindset. Our righteousness and life's accomplishments are like filthy rags or as, and as dung as the King James Bible puts it. And we place this in comparison to his power, his majesty, his provision. As St. Paul does, let us boast in our weakness. Let us boast in his power. Not as if we deserve it, but he graciously, so graciously gives us. As our weekly collect rightly proclaims, you declare your almighty power chiefly, chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Jesus meets us in our weakness. My second point is that Jesus meets us in our faithlessness. Because even though we come to him with our weakness, and he provides, it's amazing how fast we forget what he is capable of. We look at the conversation that Jesus has with his, his disciples in the 35th verse of the 6th chapter, and this is a unique portion that is not necessarily found in the other gospel accounts. And this is what it says. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him, him being Jesus, and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. In case you aren't keeping up, the disciples, who are not in charge, 
are telling Jesus, who is in charge, what to do. Jesus, don't you know what time it is? Don't you know that the people are hungry? The response of Jesus draws so much speculation of scholars and everyone who reads this. And his response is, is quite simple. You give them something to eat. Was he being serious or was he just messing them or was he just reminding them who he was? It's almost as if to say, if you think you're in charge, you take care of the problem. And their response is, well, expected. Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? How are we going to feed these people? And this is a very rhetorical question because it is a um, multifaceted problem. How many have ever had to do problem solving on a problem that is multi-tiered and complex? In just really a few seconds, Jesus lays that on their lap. And they say, we don't have that money, just so you know, Jesus. It's what they're inferring. And the chance that we actually go and find this much food is slim to none. We're not going to find this much food. And if we did, how do we haul it back? How do we even get it back here? Do you know how many wagons, how many loads? We're, we are in a desolate place, Jesus, exactly where you wanted us to be. And that is the problem. And I I wonder if Jesus knew, I think he did, what he was about to do. And he sends them back out and he says, well, go and see how much food that we have. And this next part makes me chuckle. Because they go to search for food for 5,000 people. And as we know in this story, they come back with five loaves of bread and two fish. And they have to bring that to Jesus. <laughs> that is comical. I imagine them like casting lots, drawing straw. I'm not telling them that. No, you tell them that. No, you tell them that. And it's in the middle of this that, Je- that they have to tell Jesus that all they have is five pieces of bread and two fish. In case you don't know, That is indeed not enough to feed 5,000 people. It's not enough. And you know, I find myself reading the gospel, identifying in the weakness of the disciples. Some of y'all might have the luxury of reading the text and being like, I'm disciples in moments of faith, or I'm like Jesus in this situation. No, it's typically not the, the truth. I find myself identifying with the the weakness and the faithlessness of the disciples because how many times has the Lord provided and I'm still like, Lord, how are we going to do this? But Jesus solves problems and things that aren't anywhere on anyone's bingo punch card. No one looks at this situation and says, how are we going to feed these 5,000 people? Well, of course the Lord is going to multiply matter. What? That, That was not on my punch card. And even though the disciples had been engaged in mission, powerful mission, they find themselves lacking in faith. I find myself many times praying the prayer of the father of the demonized son as Jesus is coming off of the Mount of Transfiguration, which is, Lord, help my unbelief. It's amazing because the Lord meets us in our faithlessness. And I think many times we would be impressed to see what he is capable of if we merely prayed the simple prayer of, Lord, help my unbelief. My last point is that Jesus meets us in the Eucharist. If you know anything about the Gospel of John, it does not have the Last Supper encounter. Rather, it has this story. Because John uses this to speak of the Eucharistic feast. Let me begin to draw this out for you, and hopefully we'll be on the same page. So it says in verse 40 that he sat them down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. 
And the, the image that is being drawn here is not like your traditional Hebrew meal in which they would gra- gather and, and lean around a table. Rather, we see he is lining them up for a great banquet. And the only thing he has in his hand is five loaves and two fish. And yet he's staging them for a banquet. Obviously, a little different than you would see in the, in the throne room of a king but nonetheless a banquet. You see, we have some common words that are used in every single account of the feeding of the 5,000. And in Mark, we see this. It says, In taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said, A blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. Take slash took. Bless, broke, gave. These are four words that when you see these in the text, you should have a sneaking suspicion. You're like, well, why should I have a sneaking suspicion, Adam? Let me sh- tell you the story in Matthew. It says, then, the cr- then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. In Luke 9, it says, In taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. Let me t- let's, let's go to a, a little bit different language that we might be more familiar with. In Mark 26, the institution of the Lord's Supper, or in Matthew 26, rather. Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. In Mark's uh, account of the institution of the Lord's Supper, it says as they were eating, he took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them. In Luke, it says he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. And in 1 Corinthians 11, in which, Mar- in which Paul is recalling these events as well, he says, I re- for I received from the Lord that I also delivered to you, the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, given thanks, broke it. It's pointing to the Eucharistic feast. How, look at the similarities between the two in which we, we bring some crackers or some lovely bread thank you Liz to the table and wine and in it we feast on the body and blood of Christ Jesus meets us in the Eucharist and I find it interesting that one of the ways that every gospel reader wanted to display it was that he did it to a desperate sad group of people who were exhausted and tapped out they had nothing left And that is when Jesus decides to reveal this mystery to us. You see, so many times I think with pride we come to the table of having it all together. One of the the modern um, flaws of our modern Christendom is that as church people we feel like we have to have it together. And I'm not saying that we need to become unrighteousness, we need to enter into sin but I believe we need to know that it's okay to not be okay. To come before the Lord with a broken heart that is authentic, that is raw. I read the Psalms, and David was a man after God's own heart, and the raw nature in which he pours out his heart before the Lord. Oh, that we would come to the table with that. That we would come to him saying, I know I'm weak, I know I'm tired, I know I can't do it, but you can. And I just need to meet with you, Jesus. I need to meet with you. Oh, that in times of faithlessness, that we would be honest with the Lord and say, Lord, I don't have the faith for this. I don't know if you can do this. I believe conceptually that you're omnipotent or all power and that you're omniscient, that you know everything and that you're good but I don't know if I believe you can do this. I don't know if I truly have the faith for this, Lord. Help my unbelief. 
Oh, that we would come before the table, the feast, and partake and tell the Lord, I don't know if I have faith, but I, I know that you can give this to me. I know that you can help me. I know that you can work it through with me. Oh, that we were an authentic, raw people before the Lord. It's not by our might. It's not by our power. It's by His. And so my challenge today to you as we, as I, I wrap it up here, is very simple. Are you weak? Is there something that is gnawing at your flesh? Is there something that you're like, I cannot get rid of this. And I feel like I can't show it to the Lord. Because if he saw me for who I am, he wouldn't like it. He already knows. Lay it before the Lord. If it's an issue of faith, ask him. Have you been hiding your faithlessness from the Lord instead of being honest with him and saying, Lord, I don't have faith for this. Help my unbelief. Ask him. Bring it before the Lord. It is in weakness that he came to the 5,000. It is in fa the faithlessness of the apostles that he divides the bread and multiplies it and creates a feast. Let us authentically offer our hearts to the Lord, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you hear us. Lord, I thank you that you see us, that we can't hide anything from you, Lord. That takes the pressure off of us. Lord, you saw Adam and Eve in the garden when they were hiding. And Lord, you see us when we hide from you. Let us authentically offer our hearts to you, O oh Lord. In our weakness, let you be great. In our faithlessness, Lord, let you show your power and your might and grant our prayer truly believe. Lord, as we come to your table today, let us not hide anything, Lord, because before you, no secrets are hid. But Lord, truly hear the thoughts of our heart, everything that is within us, that we may truly know you, and you may truly know us. Amen.